Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM and the IC 2300H. For more information, visit ICOMAmerica.com slash Ham Nation. This is Ham Nation, episode number 76, December 5th, 2012. Gordon receives the RCA Award. Good evening, everybody. It's time for Ham Nation. I'm Bob Heil, K9EID, and we have some real excitement tonight because Gordo's back from New York and has a, just a whole bunch of things going on that uh, we're going to hear about uh, from there. George has got his soldering iron fired up. Cheryl's going to be watching the chat room, so let's go see what's going on in uh, all their stations. Uh, Gordo, nice to have you back. How are you doing? Uh, we're doing fine, Bob, and we're getting ready for this weekend's 10-meter contest. We're hoping the sun will cooperate, but 10 meters ought to be great. And you technician class operators, 28-300 to 28-500, upper sideband, we'll meet you there around 28-400 this weekend. Also, this is the Pearl Harbor anniversary uh, weekend weekend, and the USS Batty Fish says uh, KE5HWW Mitch in Oklahoma, that's right, the submarine in Oklahoma, uh, they'll be on the air as well as other vessels. So we hope everybody has a great weekend this weekend on the air. Back to you, Bob. Those are always really great special events to work. So uh, get on and work some of them. And they have really great certificates, too, that you can do. And, uh, George, you got your soldering iron all warmed up. What you doing? As a matter of fact, Bob, I do. And uh, I'm going to use my new soldering iron tonight. It's somewhere here in the picture. I'm not going to say where. You'll just have to look and see if you can locate it, you know, like in the, the cartoons there. But got a new one, and we'll be pulling it out tonight for some smoking solder. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Cheryl, how are you? You doing okay? And you got the chat room all fired up? Yeah, we do. Hi, everybody in the chat room. How are you guys tonight? I just thought I'd... Uh say uh, I'm looking for your questions and I will be typing in there with you very shortly. I just wanted to see all the guys and welcome back to you Gordo from New York. I'm glad you're back safely and uh, I think we're gonna have a really great show and I'd love to uh, inter interact with you tonight so don't leave me on the side. You know I'm part of you guys and you mean a lot to us <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact you know with our episary rather than anniversary I know we both kind of said that but it's kind of our we had our 75 so I'm wearing my uh, Heil purple tonight because of that just kind of to celebrate a little <laughs> bit with you and uh, we'll see you in the chat room. Take care. Okay we'll be looking for you. I just got off of the uh, Collins net see if we can fire it up a little bit. This is a, uh, every month, the first Wednesday of each month, Collins uh, Collectors Association has a net on 3885 on AM. And you hear some of the most incredible signals. W-B-2-H-U-P, David in Dallas, over. And this is all AM. It's coming out of that little Mosley CM1 right over my shoulder. I love that little rig. And you can see it's all on because I just checked in there a while ago. So you want to listen on AM. There's a lot of activity up around 3885, 3880. And there's some down below and, of course, on, on uh, 40 meters and so on. But uh, most meaningful tonight, we want to get started with uh, Gordon. He has some very serious things that, that he uh, saw in the... Uh, in his trip uh, up east. So Gordo, let's uh, let's see what what's going on and uh, how you uh, how you have uh, uh, some video for us tonight. All right, uh, thanks, Bob. And uh, last week's video was brought to you by Frank Farrell, K A two T R U. Frank was one of the many hams that came to support the big. KJI get together and uh, Gene and Marianne who roll uh, KJI 
along with Drew and Randy. They wanted to have a three-day open house, and they really did on Black Friday, Saturday, and uh, Sunday after Thanksgiving. And they opened up their store to take care of those hams just to sort of get the edge off after the uh, huge superstorm Sandy. I mean, the hams were there with 5,300 uh, telephone poles down, 3,300 transformers exploding, 440 volts coming through on everybody's 110 AC line, not good, and 113,000 trees down. So it was a, uh, a big deal. But prior to that, uh, I had the uh, great opportunity to meet up with Radio Club of America. This is their 103rd banquet. Dave Sumner, K1ZZ of the American Radio Relay League, was the uh, host and uh, the main speaker. He did a rousing talk for those hams that gave up uh, a whole week of their days to uh, make ham radio happen during uh, Superstorm Sandy. And um, uh, we had a lot of awards given out, and I'm very happy to say that Carol Perry, WB2MGP, uh, RCA Board of Directors, she's a fellow of the RCA. She's in charge of youth activities, and she deserved it. And Alex, if you'll roll the uh, video... Uh, there we are, each getting the award, but Carol gets the very special one. She visits schools and museums and works up grants for donated radio equipment going into the school system. She ought to know, after 30 years teaching at uh, IS School 72 in Staten Island, uh, she made it happen, and uh, uh, she's quite deserving of that award. And uh, after uh, she uh, uh, received her award and we got ours, uh, Aaron King, AK4JG, one of her uh, uh, students and one of the recipients of the many grants that she's able to issue, uh, gave us a great symposium talk all about sending weather balloons up and uh, it just points out all the good that Radio Club of America does for uh, radio. Yeah, there's Julia enjoying my mind. Uh, it's translucent, but uh, I was quite honored. And uh, we had some very special guests at Radio Club of America, Bill Tynan who uh, got the uh, Goldwater uh, Award, and, of course, Carol got the President's Award. I had the nice, as you see there, service award. But uh, let me tell you, Radio Club of America really is investing this coming year in the school system and those of you that teach ham radio. So if you're teaching ham radio, you're part of the school system, get a hold of me, and I'll put you in touch with Carol because there's some grants available for gear, thanks to Ray at ICOM America and uh, training programs and training materials uh, uh, for the school system to get more kids into ham radio. And let me tell you, uh, after that next day, I had an opportunity to go down to uh, Battery Park and uh, see some of the damage there. And I met many hams that were there communicating uh, back and forth with uh, some of the EOCs. And uh, it was a uh, big devastation. Uh, that following day, we went up to CQ Magazine in Hicksville, where they were really hit with high winds. And let me tell you, they uh, uh, were just digging out. And this is a week after uh, the storm. So, Alex, if you'll go ahead and uh, roll the first videos, uh, actually still shots. These are shots uh, of uh, Staten Island. And you wonder what happens to all of the debris. Well, hams were there to help coordinate incoming and outgoing trucks that would pile the debris up. And you can see in back of me, these were homes, these were people's vehicles, and uh, they're due to the Department of uh, Transportation and Sanitation, all put into one spot and would be heading off to the dump. It was really quite a sight to see. But let me tell you, hams were out there, and hams were at many of these uh, uh, give-out food points on Staten Island, and uh, the hams were enthusiastic to uh, report back, uh, we need more food or we need more uh, uh, different things. And one ham uh, brought along a complete uh, phone charging system. Julian, you could have used this uh, to keep those Android phones uh, honking, and uh, that's something that ham operators can do is into a disaster uh, scene, bring those chargers like we see here. And uh, believe me, there was a lot of folks there. A lot of generators out there, but what we learned, lessons learned, is that uh, the generators with stale gas were not very effective in getting going. So in preparation, ham operators for the big one that you might have, like we did up in the Bay Area, 
make sure that you exercise your generator, make sure you've got additive to the gas because you might need it. And let me show you, this is Staten Island and uh, the storm surge came in so far that it reached all the way in town and literally leveled the houses. And ham operators were one of the first on the scene. Many of the repeaters went down, not because the repeaters failed in New Jersey and New York, but because the repeaters were tied into generators, battery backup. Finally, the generators pooped out because they couldn't get gasoline. So we were like off the air until they went to Simplex. Got a Furball, got a Fido. Well, let me tell you, ASPCA there in Staten Island was doing a fabulous job of corralling these uh, wayward animals, getting them all tagged, and there was no animal lost, and uh, every animal that uh, they could find found a safe home. And ham operators riding along uh, or right next to the setup were providing comms. So hams on Simplex, you did well. We didn't hear much HF, and this is because we had great satellite calls. That's not ham. Uh, that's, I believe, the Salvation Army that did a great job of getting messages out and messages into some of the many shelters. So that's why this year uh, we did not see ham operations on HF because, quite frankly, uh, the satellite uh, took a lot of these calls onto the Internet. So hams were uh, a, a big deal there. And uh, let me tell you, there were trees down everywhere, which made it uh, even hard for uh, Carol and I to uh, move around uh, that end of Staten Island. But I got to tell you, the spirit of these folks, uh, Bob and uh, the Ham Nation gang, was unbelievable. I'll tell you, New York, New Jersey, these folks are tough. And uh, they, made, uh, they made the best out of what they could. In fact, uh, one of Carol's uh, earlier students uh, actually opened up his store. Gus uh, Plattis opened up his uh, big uh, restaurant and uh, donated meals to the folks in the devastated area. How would you like to wake up and find a boat in your front yard? The question is, who pays for getting rid of the boat, the boat owner? or the homeowner because it's on their property. But I tell you, FEMA was there big time. Uh, as you can see, FEMA was doing inspections inside some of these homes. Um, and uh, things were quite orderly down there on Staten Island, even though it looked like complete destruction. And I tell you, there were hams all over the place. And uh, the police department was there doing a fabulous job of making sure that uh, no one would go aboard these boats and uh, lift off by uh, any marine electronics before the boat owners finally came. And you know, the Coast Guard Auxiliary played an important part. But I tell you, just walking around, when you see stuff like this, you got to be real careful because some of these lines were still hot. And again, unbelievable that incoming tide on Staten Island that took all of these boats. Coast Guard auxiliary units uh, had handhelds. They could communicate directly to uh, Coast Guard uh, aeronautical units on Marine VHF and uh, making sure that those boats that washed up in the middle of the night that there were not owners uh, needing help on the inside. So ham operators, a lot of opportunity, and that's uh, Gus's place, Gus Plattis, the former student of uh, Carol Perry, and he donated meals from this good-looking restaurant. On the back half of the restaurant, the water was lapping right up to their back door. So it really points out that hams get together. Well, we then jumped up with uh, Ken Newbeck. Uh, Ken does a, a lot of uh, aeronautical work. And hams were also airborne, reporting uh, what was happening up along the uh, shores of Long Island. And, of course, as you probably heard, there were many breaches in uh, uh, that strand of Long Island. And uh, it was seen uh, very well by these air resources with hams aboard. Uh, that should be all one big sandy beach. But as Ken, and by the way, Ken is the uh, author of the Six Meter, A Guide to the Magic Pan, um, we weren't on six this day. We were just looking at all of the devastation on uh, this uh, sand spit. And where there should be a solid shoreline, uh, it, it was wide open with the uh, water pouring in between and going out. Again, ham radio operators without repeaters were able to get on there. And let me tell you, in this thick of things, uh, here's Drew with KJI telling you a little bit about what was happening. Back side or the east side, that's what really got slammed right by Tom's River, Lakewood, Wall Township, all this barrier island on the map here is what got wiped out. 
Right there's where I live, right there. Wow. And what did you see when you were um, out there second day? Trees and wires down everywhere. Uh, detours everywhere. It was a mess. I, I, I remember last year with the snowstorm we had in, in October, that brought down a lot of trees, but nothing. that was nothing compared to this one. So uh, the ham operators were there on Simplex. And let me underscore, <laughs> there you can see a little levity there, a ham doing some fishing uh, on the uh, newly created uh, uh, fishing pond that should be all sand. The hams indicated on uh, the Long Island area that uh, their comms via aircraft, uh, many of the hams uh, were pilots, uh, the comms back to ground were all on Simplex. And I encourage all of you that if you operate Simplex, um, try and see what kind of range you can get because, uh, again, there's another dock that was just completely washed away. Uh, Simplex communications really played a very important part. And knowing how to reprogram your handheld from the field. So if you've got one of those uh, new handhelds and someone says, can you go to the repeater output, uh, you better be able to do it if you're going to be an outstanding ham. So a lot of lessons learned. And um, again, uh, I think we can all say that the East Coast uh, hams jumped right into action. There was Aries, there were races. They were making things happen. So that's just a brief look at what uh, ham radio did back there. Probably didn't hear much out here, but let me tell you, the airwaves were filled on 2 meters, 220, 440, including uh, Ken's uh, 6 meter. And uh, again, uh, Ken's the one that uh, wrote the uh, 6 meter book. But uh, thanks to those that uh, took good care of me uh, when I was back there on the East Coast. And Bob, I'll turn it back to you. And then Julian's right here, and he's ready to roll with his video. So, Bob, back to you. Well, first of all, I want to say congratulations just personally to you, Gordon. And I know we have uh, uh, many people watching and listening, but personally to you, you're the biggest and best flag waver for amateur radio that I have ever known. And I'm I'm honored and proud to know you. And, and uh, what you do for ham radio is just off the top. So thanks very much for all you do. And you are very deserving of that award. And I want you to know that. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that they uh, they did that for you. And then your work out there is it's pretty easy to have seen some of the things that you were involved in. And you're always there, man. So thanks a lot. Uh, personally, I appreciate everything. And I know all of the, the hams behind us uh, are saying the same thing. So thanks for being there. And uh, all that you're 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 uh, you're one of my favorite people man and i, I appreciate all you do for ham radio well it's great. thanks so much bob and you know uh, dave sumner at the radio club of america uh, banquet uh, was so complimentary of how ham radio operators conducted themselves in an emergency so it just points out that uh, the radio club of america is very much behind uh, ham radio it's made up of only maybe a third of ham operators. The rest are uh, uh, radio ops for their big AM or FM or digital radio stations. But uh, we'll be talking more about Radio Club of America and this very special program that Ms. Perry is inaugurated that really brings kids exposed to radio and all that ham radio and other types of radio can do for their careers. So now, live Jeez. and direct, I'm going to pull back here and we're going to let Julian... Uh, take over i've got everything adjusted here so julian what have we got uh, that's a really good question <laughs> what what do we have today uh we have a great video actually from tony meluzzi kd8 romeo tango tango who uh, answered the calls for service like so many other people did and uh he sent us in a video all about setting up an aprs i gate so if that's something that interests you watch this video because it's going to tell you exactly how to do it hi tony kd8 rtt here and today I want to show you how to set up an APRS eye gate. Now, if you're not familiar with APRS, I suggest you do a quick Google search. There's a lot of information out there about it, and it would take me way too long to explain it all here. But basically, an eye gate is used to take packets received via RF and upload them to the internet. To get started, you're going to need two pieces of hardware, a computer and some sort of receiver that can receive to the two meter band. Here in the States, the frequency we use is 144.39 megahertz, but that varies by region of the world. So again, if you're not from the United States, do a quick search online. 
In my case, I'm using an old scanner I have, but you could just as well use an extra two meter rig you have laying around. Again, you'll just be receiving, so you won't need the transmit side of things. The computer you use doesn't matter too much, as long as it has an internet connection and some sort of audio in port. Connecting the equipment is as simple as connecting your antenna to your receiver, your receiver's audio out, or in my case, a headphone out jack, to the audio in, in my case, a microphone in jack on the computer. Now, you're ready to set up the software. Okay, you're going to need to download two pieces of software. The first is the AGW Packet Engine, from the link on the screen, and the second is the APRS ISCE 32 software, uh, also from the link on your screen. We're going to first set up the AGW Packet Engine. So go ahead and open that. And I want to agree. You're going to have to go down here to your bar. Right click and go to properties. It's going to pop open this. And you want to go new port. It's going to say you must restart the program, but then it'll pop up this window. So here, you're going to want to name the port. Uh, I'll just call it 144.390 and select your TNC type. Now here we're gonna be using a sound card. So select sound card. It'll open this window. Most of the settings you're gonna leave the same except for you have to select a sound card. Um, I actually have two sound cards. I'm gonna be using the USB one. Okay, hit okay. You have to restart it. So go down here again, right click, exit, and then reopen the packet engine. So now the packet engine is set up. Now that allows your computer sound card to act as a modem with the radio. So now it's time to set up the APRS software itself. Now I've run this before, so let me delete some of those files. You're going to open this up. It's going to pop up this window. You're going to want to enter in your call sign. For passcode, you're going to need to send an email to this address saying you're, you need a passcode uh, for APRS and this software, the APRS IS CE32. Um, you're going to need to give them your call sign and your name, and within a few hours you should get a password. And you're going to enter that and hit accept. Okay, once the program opens, uh, the first thing I suggest you doing is suggest you do is hit the right arrow key about 10 times. That's just going to set up the map uh, a, little, a little bit nicer. And then you're going to have to drag and zoom in on your current location. So I'm up here in northern, northeastern Ohio. All right, once you're zoomed in your location, you're going to go up here and hit transmit. So now you are on the APRS network uh, via the internet. If you notice on, your, on the left hand of the screen down here, it'll have some stations, including your own. Those are stations that are being received via the internet. Um, you, you, the RF part has not been set up yet, but we'll go ahead and do that now. So you're going to go up to configure, down to ports, new port. Your type is going to be AGW, and your name is going to be, uh, you can name it whatever you'd like. I'm just going to name it Scanner, since that's what I'm using uh, on the RF receiver. All right, so you're going to use TCP IP. For the IP, you're going to want 127.0.0.1, and you're going to be using port 8000. All right, when this pops up... Um, since we're just an I gate and we're not transmitting anything via RF, you can deselect IS to RF and transmit enable. Hit accept. So now your I gate should mostly be set up. And that's it. You successfully set up an APRS I gate. Now, if you'd like to see the specific packets that you've been responsible for uploading to the system, go to a website like APRS.fi and search for your call sign, and you'll find them listed there. Well, that's it. So 73, and thanks for watching. All right, and like I said, that was Tony Malusi, KD8RTT, showing us how to get up a, an APRS iGate. So uh, please make sure if you want more stuff like that, how-to videos, send them to us so we can put them on the air. We got one more video, this time from Michael McConnell, W0PD. We always tell you to show us uh, pictures of your shack. He's going to show us photo, uh, a video of his shack, so it's kind of fun. Watch this one. Whiskey Zero, Papa Delta, calling CQ, calling CQ, CQ. K6JTT, this is Whiskey Zero, Papa Delta, Delta Mike 61.
Good evening, Ham Nation viewers. This is Mike McConnell, and uh, my call letters are W0PD, and I live in Horizon City, Texas, which is in El Paso County. We're just right next to El Paso, and I've been a ham radio operator for um, a little over 25 years, both myself and my wife, and um, I really enjoy Ham Nation. Currently, my station consists of an ICOM 7700. I've also got a, a Kenwood TS2000. I have a Palstar uh, AT2K tuner and an Ameritron AL800 amplifier. And for satellite stuff, which I really enjoy, I have an ICOM 910H. And I have uh, kind of a full complement of uh, equipment that helps me uh, run the, the rotors, uh, SAT PC32. And I've also got um, a couple uh, Yagi antennas. Um, I've got a Gap Challenger, a 10 through 80 vertical, really works very well. I've also got a wire antenna that runs uh, 40 through 10 meters. I've got a general radio telephone license as well as the extra class license. I really enjoy ham radio. I like working decks and I like talking to uh, just anybody. Uh, my favorite band is on 20 meters. A K7 Victor Ocean from Whiskey Zero, Papa Delta. Signal W0 Papa Delta A7DO. Uh, name's Bob here in Olympia, Washington. Go ahead. Very good, Bob. Uh, name is Mike. I am located near El Paso, Texas. I've spoken to the um, International Space Station twice, and uh, those have been some of the most cherished uh, audio cuts and clips that I have. And, uh, and I've really enjoyed that uh, probably more than uh, most anything else. Whiskey Zero, Papa Delta, W Zero PD. Okay, great. I thought I was missing a letter there. So Whiskey Zero, Papa Delta, we've got you loud and clear. It's great to talk to you again aboard the International Space Station. This is Colonel Doug Wheelock and uh, 73 to you. All right, 73. After having watched Ham Nation, you guys uh, taught us how to uh, hook up a mixer to my radio, so that's what I did, and I've got a little mixer here, a four-channel mixer, and I, I've also got the JBL studio monitors um, hooked up to my system, so I'm able to uh, get some really good audio, both going in the radio and coming out of the radio. And of course, my station has the PR um, 781 microphone for my HF, and of course I have my good old Heil headset here, which uh, works great for satellite. So thanks a lot for watching my video, and I look forward to seeing it sometime on Ham Nation 73 from W0PD. All right, Michael McConnell, W0PD talking to the space station. I mean, that's uh, pretty awesome. I'd love to have a video myself of that conversation going on with me trans talk, talking to the astronauts up there. So um, please, if you have videos, if you think you can make something like either of those two videos, please go ahead, just post them up on YouTube and send me the link to n3jf at awrl.net. And then uh, if, uh, uh, if they look like something we can put up on Ham Nation, we'll get in contact and uh, we'll get them on the show. So please, again, Put them up on YouTube, send me the link, and uh, we'll get your videos up on the show. So uh, back to you, Bob. Thanks very much. Oh, Bob's microphone is down. Uh oh, That's maybe. That's uh, so super. Uh, I I, uh, I had had the mic down because I was listening to the net, and I didn't want to get it over there. <laughs> what a great station. And somebody in the chat room said he expected uh, bunches of monobanders. See, there again. You don't have to have wild antennas to work the world, just have to have ones that are efficient, and I'm sure he's done that right. So congrats on a great station. Congrats on a great video. That's the kind of stuff I like to see, uh, uh, see what's going on with other stations. That was really good. So uh, make it happen, and uh, Julian will make sure that it's right before it gets aired. <laughs> well, we're going to take a, a little trip down to New Orleans and hear about some news of what's going on in amateur radio from Don. So Don, take it away with Newsline. From Amateur Radio Newsline report number 1842, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, December 5th, 2012. 
The FCC has issued ET docket 12-338 that, if passed as written, is pretty good news for ham radio. Released on Tuesday, November 20th, it proposes to modify the rules governing a number of communication services for amateur radio, which falls under Part 97 of its rules. And the proposed changes are quite positive. Starting at the low end of the electromagnetic spectrum and working our way up, Docket 12-338 proposes the creation of a permanent, albeit shared allocation, from 135.7 to 137.8 kilohertz with a power output of 1 watt effective radiated power to an isotropic radiator. Now going up a few hundred kc to the 160 meter band, that's where docket 12-338 proposes to change the amateur service allocation to make 1800 through 2000 kilohertz a primary amateur service allocation. As we said, it's pretty good news for ham radio here in the United States. From the newsroom in Los Angeles, I'm Bill Pasternak, WA6 ITF. There's a lot more to the story and you'll find a link to the full text of the docket in this week's amateur radio newsline report. The National Transportation Safety Board wants to eliminate all driver distraction and is broadening its focus on the use of portable electronic devices in all types of vehicles. The issue is part of the NTSB's recently released 2013 Most Wanted list. While acknowledging that distractive driving didn't begin when people began making calls or texting in the car, the National Transportation Safety Board still says that portable electronic devices that do not directly support the task at hand have no place in any vehicles. As such, it argues that states and regulators can set the proper tone by banning the non-essential use of such devices in all areas of transportation. The NTSB goes on to say that companies should develop and vigorously enforce policies to eliminate distraction. It also says that manufacturers can assist by developing technology that disables these devices when in reach of operators. But the NTSB has some strong opposition from the Consumer Electronics Association. That organization says that while it applauds the effort, it also notes that the NTSB misses the mark on the use of portable electronics in vehicles. It says that calling for the abstinence-only approach, the NTSB ignores established realities of human behavior. It also claims that in-vehicle technology, when used correctly, can make for vastly safer roadways. How any of this might affect mobile or even handheld pedestrian portable operations in the future by ham radio operators is at this time unknown. But the NTSB stand seems to be that any and all forms of distraction must be removed from the public hands while in transit. And that's not likely to sit well with the public at large. Norm Seeley, KI7UP reporting. The NTSB has no authority to enact transportation policy nor to force transportation policy changes. However, it makes recommendations to governments, industry, and the public and uses its most wanted list as a way to highlight changes that it's advocating. In the wake of Hurricane Sandy, a disaster readiness fair that highlighted solar oven cooking, water storage, 72-hour emergency kits, and amateur radio communication demonstrations has been held in Temecula, California. The event, hosted by the Temecula Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, took place Saturday, November 10th. At the event, dozens of tables with information and demonstrations on topics pertinent to emergency preparedness were set up in and around the church facility. Gordon Newell's N6ELS manned a booth promoting amateur radio certification. It was noted that in case of a disaster where normal lines of communications are interrupted, amateur radio can be used to relay information as well as to send for help and other assistance. Amateur radio operators who were among the first responders following a 7.4 magnitude earthquake that hit San Marcos, Guatemala, claiming at least 52 lives, have been thanked for their efforts. International Amateur Radio Union Region 2 Emergency Communications Coordinator Cesar Pio Santos, HR2P, said he was very proud of the work done during and after the earthquake on November the 8th, despite the difficult times. About 10,000 houses have been affected by the earthquake, with authorities setting up 11 rescue centres for the homeless. Relief efforts were helped by the work of radio amateurs. That's WIA newsman Robert Broomhead, VK3DN. This was the worst quake to hit Guatemala since 1976, when a 7.5 magnitude timbler caused the deaths of about 23,000 people in one of the worst natural disasters of the time. And finally, congratulations to astronaut Ellen Ochoa, KB5TZZ, in being named the next director of the Johnson Space Flight Center in Houston, Texas.
Ochoa was the first Hispanic woman to go into space. Since September 2007, she served as Johnson Space Flight Center Deputy Director. Prior to that, she worked as Deputy Director of Flight Crew Operations at JSC and in September of 2006 became Director of Flight Crew Operations. Ellen Ochoa will be the facility's 11th director. She will also be the first Hispanic, first radio amateur, and the second female to serve in that position. And that's all from Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news brought to you each and every week for 35 years and counting at www.arnewsline.org. I'm Don Wellbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Great report, Don. Thank you for all of that. And we really like the video stuff. Uh, hey, Gordo, you, did you uh, get in all of your travels, did you get to see the new issue of uh, CQ Magazine? Oh, wow. Riley did us well. Thank you, Mr. Hollingsworth. It was great to hear from how you. you. Like, <laughs> how do you like this little deal? All yeah, about Ham great. Nation. You got to see well, this. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Yeah. Thank you very, very much, Riley. It was well done. And uh, uh, you, you guys can get this. Uh, it's page 36, by the way. You guys can usually get to CQ Magazine on the stands. It's one of the uh, few magazines on the stand. They're still still out there and, uh, and abundant uh, uh, for the public. I, I like that a lot. Don't you, Gordo, that uh, outside the, our our family, they can buy CQ Magazine on a, on a newsstand. That's pretty cool, isn't it? It is. And uh, in meeting with uh, Dick Ross uh, and uh, Rich Moses, son, they really wanted to get the word out that ham radio is a hobby and a service that everybody could enjoy. So Riley did as well, because that's what we're about, just like the magazine, spreading the word of ham radio. That's that's really super. So thanks a lot, Riley, and thanks to everyone at CQ Magazine uh, for uh, letting uh, everybody know about Ham Nation and, and Leo Laporte's efforts to bring this to the outside world. It's really cool. Well, we're going to um, get into uh, a couple little things here in a minute about the switching that I did for all of these antennas. It'll be a couple of minutes. I think you'll be interested. But before we do that, we're going to go let Mr. Laporte come in and tell us about ICOM Radio. Hello, hams. Leo Laporte here. Don't mind me. I'm just going to interrupt. Stop the show cold. For one reason only, you know my favorite reason, the ICOM radios. Man, I love my ICOM radios. When Ray Novak came here and set up our ham shack, he blew me away with the range and the capability, the ease of use. These are great radios. I want to talk to you today about a really good radio for you. If you're looking for an, uh, a 2-meter FM mobile, it's the ICOM, the new IC2300H. Mill spec. I mean, this is rugged, compact. In fact, if you're familiar with the 2200H, it's it's a it's a, a little smaller, but the same basic panel layout, 65 watts of stable output, um, mil spec for shock, vibration, and temperature. You put that in your Jeep, you can bounce around like crazy. You're gonna love it because this aluminum die-cast chassis is not only is rugged, but it keeps it cool, so you don't have to worry about uh, temperature during continuous transmission. And by the way. You've got output power in four steps, 65 watts, 25 watts, 10, and 5 watts. A uh, beautiful display, by the way, alphanumeric, bright alphanumeric display. And I think you can do it in amber, yellow, or green in the backlight. Um, you've got 200 regular channels in the program, six scan edges, a call channel. You can, uh, six character channel names, so it makes it very easy to find the channel you're looking for. That's 207 total channels in memory. Built-in CTCSS and DTCS encoder, decoder. You got tones for quiet standby and repeater access, a tone scan function that looks for the subaudible tones when you're trying to find the repeater. And I love this, a little pocket beep uh, function that'll let you know both audibly and vid vid visually, the little light lights up if you've got an incoming call. It's a very nice, affordable, no-nonsense radio, both for your home or when you want to hit the road. This is a great mobile. It's the ICOM IC2300. I feel like we're in home shopping network. We're, we've only got five left. I want you to call. No, go visit ICOMAmerica.com slash ham nation. There's plenty left. There's one waiting just for you. ICOMAmerica.com slash ham nation, the IC2300H mobile transceiver. They've got all the information there. While you're there, take a look at the page. Register for ICOM's weekly drawing. Uh, they give away lots of fun ICOM stuff. And also, congratulations to our winners from previous weeks. They're right there on the ICOM site. Maybe one of them is you. 
ICOM, I-C-O-M, ICOMAmerica.com slash Ham Nation. We thank him so much for the support of the Ham Nation show. And now, my friends, I send it back to the smoky and soddery George, Gordo, and Bob. Take it away, Ham Nation. Thanks very much, Leo. And, yeah, the ICOM stuff is just great. Well, you've been keeping up with uh, some of the stuff I've been doing here and all this craziness in the past six months. And uh, it all comes down to what do you do with it when you get it in a console like behind me. And um, one of the things I did when I built the, the, I call it the topper to this table, uh, I slanted the radios, but it left me, and I, of course I planned this and designed it so that I had... Uh, a rack space underneath the radios that slants down and you can see that's uh, a 52080 uh, parametric EQ and all that. But on the other side is a blank panel and that blank panel was very much uh, in the plans of all this to do all the switching. Now the relay systems out in the metal for all the antennas and things and it comes with a box like this, which works really good. But I, I'd end up with a whole bunch of these. So what I did, we'll uh, run some slides here, uh, show you the, uh, the console here. You, you don't get too good of a view to the one to my left, but there it is. You'll notice underneath, that's coming up from, if you remember those toilet flanges I use with the coaxes, there's uh, about 15 of them down there. They come into a rotary switch. Yes, I know. I could have done that remotely, but I chose not to. Uh, and uh, this gives me uh, the different antennas. The big knob on the top is cool. It takes this entire console to my right and switches it to the one behind me so I can have all the vintage gear. Just one switch, boom, it all goes. But then the second slide will uh, will show you this comes up uh, with the panel that I designed. Now, I needed some switches, and I wanted uh, to do the east-west and selecting the, the directions, and I had a real tough time finding those switches. And then it got dawned on me, duh, that's what's in a Les Paul guitar. So that's what they are. I, uh, I bought 10 of them. There's uh, four on this panel, and there'll be four on another one coming up. But that allows me to switch the 75-meter antenna to east or west and the 40-meter east to west. And then it also uh, switches the 75- or 40-meter omnidirectional and to select the 7800 or the 2000 if I want to do that. Basically, that's for six meters. And then the, the one uh, LMR uh, 400, uh, that lead switches remotely on the tower from six to two meters. And uh, the other little switch turns my lights on and off. The next slide will show you the back of that panel. Uh, I, uh, I made this panel and uh, had it all laser etched and so on in the plant in Marissa or uh, in uh, Fairview Heights. I, uh, uh, I really like doing some of this stuff, planning before, and then you can punch them out and make it happen. The next slide you'll see the uh, uh, the insert there uh, and how it all worked. Right to the right of it, you can just see I, I got a, a neat little uh, digital um, meter that meters the line current. So I always know that uh, the line voltage is uh, 119, 120, whatever. Uh, right above it, you'll see that box. Now that's selecting right now the five different radios. That will be replaced with the panel on the right uh, that's my next project, and uh, uh, you can see it's uh, they just wouldn't work in all of this. I need that space, so I'll, uh, I'll have five more of those to select the radios. And then I also, to start it all off, uh, the next slide will uh, show you my diagram. Yeah, it's not done on the CAD or any of this. I just draw it out. This is how I've done it for 55 years, and I keep doing it. But there's how it works. That's the whole system to my left of all the new stuff. And uh, it uh, allows me to, to make things happen. But I thought I'd share some of that with you, and some of you might be able to pick up some ideas uh, of how to do some of your switching. And uh, so now I, I have to go down to Mississippi and get graded. Th this is really tough because I do this live. So, so, okay, George, was it okay? I mean, what, what, what do you think? 
I think it looked fantastic, Bob. I, I really like the classy touch of the gold on those uh, Les Paul pickup switches there. And I was going to ask you, how did you get the lettering on the cabinet there? But you just explained you had that laser etched. Yeah, we have a laser etch in the plant. That's how we do some of our logos and stuff on the microphones. And uh, there, there are companies that, that does all of that. Uh, you can uh, you can have that done. Uh, just tell them what you want. I'll make you a panel like that, $30, $40. You can have a panel all punched and done like that if you wanted to go to uh, outside sources. There's a lot of people doing that. Uh, so that's how I did it. Well, that's really neat, and uh, I'll, I'll be interested to see it when you get the whole thing set up there. And we want to just watch you one day flip all those switches and, and do your thing. <laughs> well, I, I do it now because it's really great. Like a while ago uh, with the Collins Net, we had people from all over. We had East Coast, West Coast, that kind of thing. And then sometimes uh, I get caught in the middle here, so I had to put up another coaxial dipole it's omnidirectional that's what that one switch is for and then i can have an omnidirectional one so yeah you switch them around to get the best signal report so that's it so what you uh, what do you use uh, soldering and smoking tonight what's happening in mississippi well we're back trying to finish off that soft rock project we've been working on for several weeks now and we're building on the uh, rx mixer stage this week and I got a new toy to play with, too, so let's take a look at that. This week on Smoke and Solder, it's part five of the Soft Rock RX TX Ensemble build with the RF mixer stage. Now, the mixer stage is a quadrature sampling detector, and it acts like two direct conversion mixers operating in tandem. Each of them takes in half of the filtered RF from the bandpass filter stage and one of the quadrature center frequencies. Then it mixes or downconverts them to an output with a traditional mixer product. In this case, there will be two audio frequency signals that represents the difference between the two inputs of the RF and local oscillator. These two signals are referred to as the detected I, which is in phase, and Q, which is quadrature, and they are fed to high gain op amp stages for amplification and delivery to the audio output, which is the PC sound card. The mixer is enabled by the QSD enable line, which is controlled by Q9 of the RF IO control stage. And when the push to talk line is activated, the QSD enable line goes high, which disables the RX mixer. Now, if you've been watching me for a while, you've noticed that I've become a big fan of the hot air method for soldering surface mount components. And I've been using this little hot air embossing tool that I picked up at a hobby shop. It works okay. Occasionally, since it puts out a good bit of airflow, it'll blow my parts around on the board. But it works pretty good nevertheless. However, recently, like in the last couple of weeks, I ran across this, <sighs> a Tenma mm -hmm. digital rework station, and I couldn't pass it up. These normally go for $69.95, which is a good deal. However, MCM Electronics had a one-day sale, and they had them for only $39.99. I couldn't resist, so I picked up one. If you're a member of the Facebook group for Amateur Logic or Smoke and Solder, you would have seen my post about this and might have got in on the deal. Several other hamps did purchase these, and everyone's given it pretty good reviews so far. So I'm looking forward to using it here tonight for the first time. Now the two buttons on the right hand side allow you to raise or lower the temperature on the unit to set it however you want it. And there's also a pot that allows you to adjust the fan speed. So maybe now I won't be blowing my parts around. So let's jump in and start on the RX mixer here. You know, I generally like to do the surface mount components first and I'll mark them so I know where I'm soldering. This is going to be pin 1 of U10, the mixer IC that we'll be using. And we're going to mark our capacitor to C71 over here. So we'll put a little of the solder paste on here and position our components. And now let's try out our new rework station. You might notice that it looks like I've got more solder paste on there than I usually do. It didn't go on good and even this time. 
And that's actually just a little thin layer instead of a couple of little beads of it. I'm hoping it's not too much. There we see it's starting to flow now. Got one end going and the rest of it's heating up pretty quick. And I've got the fan speed low, so I'm not blowing the chip around. You just saw it pull itself into place there as it lined up. Let's move on now and get capacitor C71 right here. And this shouldn't take very long to do. And you notice it jump into place as well. So I like it. The rework station seems to have done a good job. And we need to inspect it, so I'll pull out a magnifying glass and look at everything real close. And then I'll use a dental pick to make sure that each of the pins is seated firmly and looks like we're ready to go. We've only got a few top mount components to put in. First, we'll put in C41, which is a .047 microfarad capacitor, as well as C42, the same value. And then we've got a couple of resistors, R55 and R58. Now, these are band-specific, so we need to look at our charts, and we find that in my case, I'm doing the 40, 30, and 20 meter version, so I need to use 10 ohm resistors. It'll only take a moment to solder these in and clip the leads back, and then we'll be ready to do some testing. Now, the first thing we'll check is the current draw. We've got our ammeter in series, so we connect it up. We've got 7.1 milliamps, which is about what we had last week. Now, this particular stage does not really add to the current draw. Next, we'll do a few voltage tests, and we need to be sure that we've got the USB connector plugged in and the software running on our PC. Now, these first tests will be done with the push-talk function off. We're measuring from ground to pin 8 of U10 here, and there we should have 0 volts, and we do. And we'll also want to take a measurement from pin 1, and here we've got 0.6 millivolts and the spec is anywhere between 0 and 50 millivolts. Next we'll measure pin 2 and here the nominal value is 2.5 volts. We've got 2.64 so close enough on that one. And then off to pin 14 we've got 2.61 so close enough on that one. On pin 7 we also expect around 2.5 and we've got it. And the same thing holds true for pin 9. Now pin 16 will expect around 5 volts. Next we'll use the config softrock software to turn on the push to talk line. And now on pin 1, instead of 0 volts, we should have 5 volts. And we pass. So next week we'll complete the receiver with the receive op amps and output. And we'll even find out if that receiver works next week. Uh, I already know because I've been, been building on it this week. But we'll do some tests next week and see how it all turns out. And then we've only got uh, a few stages till we've got the transmitter working on it as well. This has been a fun project. And if you'd like to build one, uh, go check it out at 5 com and learn more about the different versions of the soft rock that are out there. Now, ICOM, uh, you know, has another contest going on right now. Uh, it's in association with Amateur Logic, as well as Howl Sound, Gordon West Radio Schools, MFJ, and the Wireman. And that's coming to a close here very soon. You have through Saturday to register if you'd like to win an IC7200, an ICM Howl microphone, uh, coax from the Wireman, power supply, tuner, and antennas from MFJ, and training materials from Gordon West Radio Schools, go check out the latest episode of AmateurLogic.tv and learn how to enter the contest. doesn't cost anything. It's going to be a random drawing, and we'll be announcing the winner on the 15th, but you have through Saturday the 8th to get your entry in there. So uh, go check it out now if you haven't already. And in our weekly contest here, uh, last week I asked the question, what is the um, the process or uh, anomaly that makes it hard or near impossible to solder aluminum? And we got an answer from Ben Williams, KB3ERQ, and he says oxidation is the problem that usually prevents soldering aluminum. Uh, congratulations, Ben. 
We'll be getting that Morse code Breaking the Barrier book from MFJ out to you this week. And for next week, I've got another batch of books here from our friend uh, Jerry Buston, Constructing HF Wire Antennas. And if you'd like one of these, call your local ham radio store and uh, tell them. You know, odds are they've got it in stock there and can get you a copy. It's a great little book. Got a, It's condensed. I mean, it's got just what you need to know in there. So you can grab this thing and do a quick read through and find out what you need to know to construct HF wire antennas. If you'd like to win that, well, answer this. What is this circuit and where is a ham most likely to see it? I think it's a pretty easy uh, answer there, don't you, Bob? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you should know that. Uh, th I think that was one of the questions, but uh, I'm not certain if they're still doing those kind of questions. <laughs> Been a while since I took my test, but they should. <laughs> it's easy stuff. That's great. Well, we're uh, we're always happy to uh, see what you got going on. And one thing I want to I want to show you real quickly before we get over to Cheryl. We got some slides. I, we have this guy on the show, um, Terry uh, K5ZBY, sent me just an email. And I enjoy the show. Sent me a couple of pictures. Check this out of this guy's homebrew stuff. Uh, I think he must obviously be a, a, a car collector too. Wait till you see some of the finishes. Now, to some of you that might just be getting into the hobby, this is what we did and some still do. There's another view of the top of it. Uh, he built this on a, on a piece of wood, but it's all beautifully done. Look at that, wow. George. Man. That is nice. Boy. But the next picture, look at this, what he does to the chassis. They're gorgeous. And uh, uh, the plug-in coils for each band, uh, this was a receiver that he built. Uh, do the selection on the left side and then the band spread to fine tune it on the right and the back of it you can see where he plugged in the uh, the coils uh terry this is an incredible <laughs> job look at this um, beautiful so we have a lot more we'll, we'll feature those uh in the coming weeks and see if we can get terry on here to show us some of the, the ways he does some of this i was just really really fascinated by that because that's how i grew up in this hobby was building that kind of stuff and it, i've said it before i say it maybe too much it was my college education it's how i learned to do what i do uh, in this hobby so really really uh, really super I, I just thought that was great stuff. Well, we're going to move up to northern Illinois. I'm sure there's some questions that uh, should arise. I'm going to answer a couple of them I saw real fast. Somebody asked about the desk. Uh, I had a local guy here in Springfield do these, and they were 400 bucks a, a, a piece. I couldn't believe it. Uh, uh, he did all of this work the, exactly the way that I wanted it done, and uh, they just fit right down over these tables we had. That was great. And the switches, uh, no, you can get them on the Internet. There's uh, there's all kinds of guitar parts you can buy uh, on the Internet. So they're all available there. I just thought, wow, that guitar switch, that's what it was. And bingo, I was off and running. Cheryl, how you doing up there? And hey. What's <laughs> going on? Hi, Bob. Hey, I got a quick question for you. We got a W5JCS. He asks you. If that is a new Collins receiver behind you this week, he didn't remember seeing that. Uh, -uh. it's been with me for decades. That's a 75A4. It was one of the last 300 built. Uh, the Collins people are telling me uh, the uh, the piece over here to its right is the HT37, and then to the left is my original 1956 uh, SX99 nice. uh, Hallicrafter receiver. And then above it are the transmitters. We're going to get into some of those transmitters. That's a Drake 2B receiver up the black one. And nice then, of one. course, the, the uh, Mosley. I love that little Mosley. So that's the answer. No, it's been around for a long time. I got the lights going in it, so maybe it's just lit up a little differently. 75A4. Perhaps. Perhaps. They're nice. They're all nice pieces of equipment. We all wish we had those. You know, there was another guy in there tonight, uh, Bob, that would be Mike, KB1 UGS, and I'm surprised I never asked you this myself. It's going to be an easy answer for you, but 
Does canine EID stand for anything in particular? Oh, no, that was my, I, I was uh, licensed as KN9 uh, EID as a novice in 56. No, that was a, a call that was issued by the FCC. Very good. Thanks. Thanks for that answer. And moving along to George, I've got some here for you. It's it's not going to be, uh, I have a few of them, so I hope you're ready, George. But first off, K0 MD, he says, you always make those projects look so easy. I couldn't agree with him more on that. But moving on to the questions here, VE3 MIC Mike, he says, uh, did that uh, that desoldering uh, device you were using does it come with additional tips or nozzles at all? Uh, you mean the rework station? Yeah, yeah. it comes with uh, three different nozzles on there, three different sizes, and I don't know much about rework stations yet. This is my first one, but it looked like a good selection to me. Okay, and AC2BA Dave also wanted to know where you where you picked up that rework station. Is it something you you purchased on online, or where did you get that thing? Yeah, I got that from uh, MCM Electronics. Uh, they sell the Tenma T E N M A brand, and you can find those around from uh, other companies as well. Someone said you could get that same price on eBay, but I went and looked, and I didn't see any for sale on eBay. So. Uh, just, you know, from everything I've learned, sixty nine ninety nine is a good price for it. But, boy, when they put it for 39 I have to grab it. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. And one last question on the same note is WB0EOD. He says, does the rework station do through-hole vacuum desolder? That's a good question. Uh, you know, if you wanted to hold it there long enough, I guess it would melt regular solder. But uh, uh, I think that the solder paste melts at a little lower temperature. Uh, I wouldn't recommend trying to uh, do regular soldering with a rework station, I don't think. Okay, great. Um, George, one last thing. JH1GRT, he says, nice T-shirt, George. And he oh. says, now here's the question. <laughs> Have you been to Moose Jaw? S-A-S-K, Sask? No, my wife visited the website. I, I think that's where this came from. Okay, very good. Well, I loved your video earlier. You always do such a great job, um, and we really do appreciate that so much that you get that out there for us. And there was another question uh, for Gordo, actually, here. And it comes from... Uh, the well-known uh, uh, Ray N9JA himself, he says, at Angel Quartz Fest, um, aren't you, Gordo, one of the VEs, VECs? And um, if 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 you are, we wanted to know that, he says. So are you a VEC at that, at that uh, particular Quartz Fest? Uh, we are a VE, and yes, uh, we will be offering exams uh, at uh, the Quartz Fest uh, get-together. In fact, next week, I've got videos, and uh, thanks to Russ, Y-A-F, last four, last three, uh, we're going to show Quartz Fest videos. And yes, we will be doing volunteer examinations. Excellent. Well, that sounds that sounds very very good to bring some more hams online or upgrades, whichever whichever the case may be. It's always it's always a good thing to move up. I still have yet to get the extra. That's on the agenda. I haven't forgotten that. I'll probably have to have Gordo's uh, help on that and see what he has to offer so I can get that on its way finally. This this next coming year is the goal and on that one. So um, also, Gordo, you might be able to answer this. Are there any other frequencies that might work better than 7268? That came from WA8YXM. Is there an alternate or something else that you might think of? You know, there very well could be. In fact, we've got it tuned in uh, right now. You can hear it in the background. So if someone thinks that they've got a more clear frequency, let us know, and we'll sure consider it. But, yep, we got a lot of band spread, and I bet there are additional frequencies. And thanks again to Ray and ICOM for helping KJI out with some of those great prizes that ICOM donated during Gene and Marianne's get-together. Back to you. Great. Thanks, Gordo. And also, we have a VK3PB, as in uh, Peter Baker. Any chance that Ham Nation could could tee up a live conversation with the ISS during one of the shows? Whether it would maybe it could be recorded if necessary, but it's uh -huh. kind of a, something I'd toss out there for discussion, for discussion's <laughs> sake only. Uh, who wants to take that one? 
that that would be a little tough let me tell you but uh, it could be done but uh, uh, it would be a, a little a little tough uh, especially uh, trying to do it live you never know what's going to happen well Cheryl thanks very much and thanks to the chat room we're uh, really really happy that uh, all of you are tuning in and telling your friends about this great show and uh, we appreciate Leo and all of the facility back in uh, Petaluma to put it together so uh, we're going to fire up here on uh, 7268 7272 there's the several frequencies uh, uh, Gordo what have you got that's clear you got something there that the mic's clear on right now uh, I think we're okay on 7268 Julian says there's alternates but uh, tonight let's try it on 7268 I think we I think we'll get through. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good deal. Well, we'll uh, we'll go check all those out as well as uh, the Collins AM that's still going. And uh, <clears throat> I have uh, another one over my shoulder. The uh, the Who are on uh, CBS right now, <laughs> or will be in awesome. a few minutes. I got to go check out what Townsend's doing. So 73, everybody. It's been a great night, and then we uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, Cheryl, thanks for your help. George, keep the solder smoking. And uh, Gordo, once again, congratulations. And uh, we really want to thank again the CQ guys for putting Ham Nation up front in their December, the current issue. Uh, and Riley, you, you done us proud. I appreciate that very much. So 73, everybody. We'll see you next Wednesday right here on good old Twit Network with Ham Nation. Bye-bye for now. This is K9EID. Bye -bye.